Hey everybody! Today, Rado runs through the Gaia Project, which is a sequel to the super popular Terra Mystica. And I'm going to be showing you how it works today in a two-player run-through. Although, before I get going, I strongly recommend you turn your subtitles on to the Klingon channel, so that when I make rules goofs, and I will, you'll know what they are. Okay, have you done so? Then, welcome to the Terra Mystica Galaxy, which is randomly composed of all these different sectors. And so every time you play, you get a completely different layout board. And also, I'm playing a two-player run-through today, so there are seven sectors in total. With three or four players, there would be three additional sectors. And now, it's interesting, right off the bat, when you're setting up the game, you can go for a totally randomized galaxy like this, or you can set it up, the rules talk about how to set it up, so you get the exact same galaxy every time. If you're a Terra Mystica fan who really likes that sort of chess-like, hey, every time I sit down and play, I know what the landscape's going to be, how am I going to leverage it? Uh, which is why um, all these little numbers are on here that tell you which way they're supposed to be rotated, and you're supposed to line them up with these little stars so you can get the exact same galaxy that's kind of balanced every time. But today, I have made a randomly generated galaxy, and we'll see how well I can exploit it. Other setup stuff that has to happen at the beginning of the game is there are these little booster tiles. In a two-player game, there's five of them chosen randomly from, gosh, how many are there? There must be almost a dozen of them, I guess? Uh, there are a bunch of them. And in this game, these five are the one, or there's ten of them total. These are the five that will be available to us. We'll come back to them in a second because there's more setup variability. Over here, we've got the um, round tracker. This game lasts for six rounds, and in each round there is a randomly selected bonus point objective to take uh, to chase after. In this game, in the first round, we're going to be wanting to build our best buildings possible, the Institute and the Academy, um, because it's worth five points if we can pull that off, which is a big deal. Uh, later on in the game, we're going to want to do terraform in round three, and in round five, it's going to be when we're going to be pushing our tech trees up. And in round, the last round of the game is when, if we are colonizing Gaia planets, the green planets, at that point, it's worth three. Um, so, but you know, there's a ton of these as well, and every time you get a random selection, so you'll get a very, very different set of objectives to follow throughout the game, and at the end of the game, because every time you set up, you pick two end game objectives as well. And in this game, whoever has, whoever has colonies in the most sectors, there's up to seven sectors, scores 18 points. 12 points for second place, six points for third place. And whoever is deployed, the most of these little satellite tokens can get 18 and then 12 and then 6. And now here's the interesting thing. This is only for a two-player game. As part of setup, once you've chosen what they are, you put a non-player character's cubes out here to represent competition. Um, because remember, there's a first, second, and third place. If it ended up that I um, ended up in seven, all seven sectors of this galaxy, the dummy player is considered to have done six of them, um, which means uh, that I, I maybe came in first place, and if Jen, Jen, if she wants to compete, she's got to make it all the way up here. Just um, getting a single one would only get her third place. So that's an important element of setup as well. So we've got our in-game objectives, our mid-game objectives, we've got our galaxy, we've got our boosters. And now based on that combination of stuff, players then choose what alien race they want to be. And if I recall correctly, I believe there are 14 unique races. They all have special abilities, strengths, and weaknesses and stuff. And in this game, I'm going to be the brown Taclon, a kind of insect race. We're a social insect group, um, you know, hive mind kind of thing. We love rocky planets. And our main power is, well, first of all, we start with one um, quantum intelligence cube. These are very, very cool little uh, cubes. So we start with one. We're pretty smart. And we have the, oh, what's it called? The, um, the brain stone. We start with the brain stone. Although, unfortunately, it starts here in, the, um, in the, the dead space of our intergalactic power. If, over the course of the game, I can charge it up and then get it active, we can unleash the power of the brain stone. That's a special thing that only we have. Which means, um, if we get it activated, we can have more power than anybody else in the galaxy. Um, and we have some quantum intelligence. Also, um, if I build my institute, I enhance the social bonus I have for um, for being next to neighboring planets uh, of you know my opponents. So the sooner I get this built, the more I can take advantage of my social insect superpower. All right. So that's me. 
And Jen, meanwhile, she is the yellow Glean race, which are basically intergalactic miners. Now, it's interesting, they actually start with an with a, uh, impediment. They are not smart enough to understand quantum intelligence cubes. When, if ever they should pick up a quantum intelligence cube, instead they get one ore because, oh, we don't understand these cubes, we'll just take some rocks. Or heck, maybe they get the cubes and they think it's a rock, I don't know. But anyway, so they d that's a kind of a bummer. But on the flip side, they're good navigators. Everybody, as you can see, by default starts at level zero on the, the, the AI track, the navigation track, the Gaia forming track, etc., etc. But the Gleans start actually at level one on the space navigation track, which means as soon as anybody gets there, they should get a, a QI cube, a quantum intelligence cube. But remember, the Gleans don't understand those, so instead, they get one extra ore. You can see how there's a reminder. You start with four ore, three knowledge, and 15 space bucks. And if you ever get more than 15, you've got a second thing, so you can keep on working your way up. Hey, I've got 22. 15 plus 7 is 22 space bucks. But anyway, so because they start out, they should get a quantum intelligence cube. They don't get it, so instead they start with one extra ore. Um, also, they've got a bonus. They love building on Gaia planets. They get two points every time they build on a Gaia planet. So they definitely want to be doing that as fast as possible. Which is interesting because in this game, at the in the last round, during round six, there's three points to be had for anybody doing a Gaia planet. So normally, in this game, it might be that people didn't go after Gaia Planets till almost the end of the game to get those three bonus points. But now Jen, her special power of getting two points whenever she does it means she might try to gobble up all the Gaia Planets of this galaxy long before we ever reach round six. And that's something i got to bear in mind. Normally I'd want to wait, but maybe I want to grab them sooner to prevent Jen from getting those two points. Uh, with more players, you wouldn't want to do that, but in a two-player game, zero-sum is king. So anyway, Jen's got a detriment. She doesn't understand quantum intelligence, which I'll I'll explain a bit in a... But she does have navigation, she gets bonuses, and the power she will unlock if she makes her little uh, planetary institute is, she can instantly make a federation. Ma making an a interstellar federation is one of the biggest, most expensive things you can do in the game. It has huge benefits. Uh, normally, you have to work quite a while. You won't be able to do it until halfway through the game, but Jen could do it very, very quickly because she is the glean. But all of that comes at a price. She does not understand quantum intelligence. So Jen is the yellow player. I am the brown player. We've both chosen. By the way, these are two-sided. There's a completely different type of brown player, a completely different type of yellow player. Anyway, we know who we are, and now the last thing we do before we start going is we have our initial mining colonies placed out, which is I'm going to place um, a, a, a brown mining colony, then Jen will place a yellow one, and then Jen will place another one, then I'll place one. So it's you know, ABC and then CBA if we were playing a three-player game. So I'm the first, as the first player, to claim a colony. And I like brown rocky plants, so that's what I'm going to colonize. I can choose this one, this one, this one, or this one. There's four of each type of planet. I will choose <clears throat> I will choose this one for a couple of reasons. One um, is it's right next door to a desert planet. And if I want to colonize other planets, ideally I want to colonize other rocky planets because that means I don't have to terraform them to make them friendly for our race. I can just move right in. But um, if I want to move into this Earth-like planet, gross, who wants to live there? I have to terraform it. Now, interestingly, Earth-type planets for me are the toughest thing to terraform. Um, though you know the, the lava planets and the Earth planets require three terraforming steps. Desert planets only require one terraforming step. So I don't mind being right next to another desert planet because, hey, I can terraform that later and, and claim it pretty cheaply. So that's why I jumped there. I have another reason. Remember, I eventually unlock a, ver a sweet uh, social neighborhood bonus for being next to other players, and Jen is the desert planet race. Jen might move in here as well. She might choose to start there, which means we'll be neighbors and I'll be able to leverage my neighborhood bonus a bit better. So we'll see how that goes. But anyway, so I've chosen one. And by the way, in doing that, I have increased my income. Every I get At the beginning of every round, everybody gets income uh, based on how many little hands they've got on their board. Right now, if the round started, I would get one ore and one knowledge. But because I built this, I get two ore. So now I'm going to place one. Now Jen places one and then she places and I place. So Jen will go here because, or no, here, because, remember, Jen loves Gaia planets. She has to go on a yellow planet. There's two Gaia planets pretty close by. There's a trans-dimensional planet that can be converted into a Gaia planet. This is a good spot for her. So she takes that, and now, and she's increased her income, and now she does another one, because everybody starts with two. And Jen, so she, is she going to be my neighbor? 
Is she going to be out here in the middle of nowhere? Nobody, nobody around? Nope. Jen's going to come over here because, again, she loves Gaia planets. And by association, that means she also loves transdimensional planets that can be converted into Gaia planets. So Jen has chosen her two starting areas. She is now making three ore every round. And now I choose one more. And I'm like, oh, you didn't come visit. Well, you know what? I'll still be her neighbor. I'll come over here. Because um, systems are considered to be neighboring if they're within two spaces of each other. So we are neighbors over here. I would have liked to be neighbors over here too, but we're neighbors over there. Right! One last thing to do as part of setup. In reverse turn order, we grab one of these booster bonuses. So Jen grabs one, and then I grab one, and then the game can begin. Thanks for your patience, everybody. So, now Jen... She's got a plan, and it's going to require a lot of ore. She's going to do a lot of building in this first round, which means if she gets this, she gets um, an extra ore and some knowledge as part of her income. If she takes this, she gets extra ore, and she gets points every time she makes a mining colony. Now, she's not planning on making mining colonies this round, so I think she'll, she'll go with this one to get the knowledge and the ore. And so now, I get one of the remainders. I would also like some ore, but I don't know if I'm going to be making many. Oh, maybe I'll make a colony. Oh, but you know what? I've got this Mind Stone. I want to get this Mind Stone cycled into position as fast as possible. So I'll take this one because it lets me do two power. It also increases my interstellar reach by three. Normally it's one, which means I could go from here to here, or I could go from here to here. But hey, with a reach of three, I could go from here all the way over here, another brown uh, planet for me to grab. So this is pretty cool. And so that decides me. Okay, now these rest, they'll be available in the next round. Although if you're more players, everybody grab one. Phew! Setup is done, folks. It is time to begin. We're starting round one. Fight! And remember, in round one, everybody who can make an institute or an academy scores five points. So we definitely both want to get that done, but we'll probably go around it different ways. We'll see. So the first thing that happens in a round is we get our income. I was just talking about that. I get one, two, three, or boop, 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 one knowledge. If I had a, a lab built, I'd get two knowledge or even three knowledge, but I just get one knowledge. And because of my booster, I get to cycle two power right now. And now, the, how does this work? Basically, you have these three um, states that your intergalactic power, it's kind of like your political influence and all that, it has in three states. Completely dead and useless, starting to charge up, and actually active power. Whenever you cycle, you move stuff from dead to charging, or from charging to ready to go. And the thing is, whenever you're moving, and I'm going to move two of my chips around. So you think, hey, I just want to move two of these over here, so I've got two power ready to go. It doesn't work that way. You, if there's any that are in the dead zone, you have to charge them into charging first. So I'm moving two, so I will move two. I'll move this power, and I'll move the hive mind, or the power mind, or whatever it's called. So. Now, I want to get this over here so I can use it, but I can't do that until this gets charged up later. So anyway, so I got that as part of my income as well. Now, Jen has her income. She also gets three ore. One, two, three. She gets one knowledge, and she gets one more knowledge and one more ore. So uh, that was Jen's income. Okay. And now, the next thing that happens, after everybody gets their regular income, they, um, they do their Gaia. If they have any Gaia projects going on, they deal with that. And now, at the beginning of the game, we don't. But let's talk about that for a second. Um, there are all these different planets. Gaia planets are the most valuable, in this game especially. Um, but, uh, you know, if regular planets, we just have to terraform to turn into our type of thing, and then we can colonize them and start building buildings on them and stuff like that. There are these trans-dimensional planets, which are basically just big swirling vortexes of energy. And um, one of the things we can do is we can convert those into Gaia planets. They are kind of like, you remember Star Trek, uh, The Wrath of Khan, the, uh, the Genesis Project. You just create a planet. We have the ability to do that. It's actually, it's why the name of the game is Gaia Project. The Gaia Project is turning one of these swirling vortexes of energy, a transgen planet, into a Gaia planet. That's what we're shown on the box cover right there. Now, how do we do it? Well, we can't at the beginning because nobody has leveled up to actually get a Gaia converter or a Gaia former. These things we can install out here on these, um, you know, these transdimensional planets. And so if on a previous turn Jen had done that, at the beginning of the turn, this is when they would get they would finish their job and suddenly it would become a Gaia planet ready to be colonized. But at the beginning of the game, nobody has unlocked that power yet because we haven't worked our way up that particular tech tree. So we're skipping that. We did our income. We then do our, our Gaia stuff, if we have any, but we don't. And now the game begins. I am the first player, remember? And so I'm going to do one of these eight actions. I can build a mining colony. I can trigger a Gaia project. 
if I have that technology. I can upgrade existing colonies I've got. I can create a federation if I've got enough colonies on the board. I need seven total strength worth of colonies to make a federation, which is a big, big deal if I do it. I can spend knowledge, foreknowledge, to increase in one of my technology levels. And hey, I have foreknowledge, so I could do that right now. Or I can get access to special actions if I've got the special purple actions, green actions, or orange actions if I've got those resources. Or finally, I could pass. Now, I'm not going to pass until I'm done. But the first player to pass gets um, the first player marker for the next round. And when I pass, I take one of these boosters that I will have for the next round, and then I return this, which means another player might be able to grab that for the next round. OK, so what am I going to do first? Remember, I was talking about this. Uh, this round, we want to get our institute or our academy built. I'm going to start working on that. I am going to upgrade one of my existing colonies. Uh, as you can see, a colony becomes a trading house. A trading house could then become a lab or an institute, and a lab could become a, an academy. You're reminded about this right here on the board as well. Here, colonies can work their way up into trading houses, which can work their way up into institutes or labs. Labs can become academies. Right, so I've already got two mines on the board. I'm going to upgrade one of them. I am, a mine becomes a trading house. I'm going to convert this mine into a trading house, because it's the first step towards getting an institute, which I want to do to get those five points. Now, you'll notice something interesting happened here. Um, I, uh, because I'm building this, I'm increasing my monetary income every round, but I'm decreasing my ore income because I swapped these two tokens. Right, so I'm building that there. How much does it cost? It costs two ore and either three or six bucks. So let's go ahead and pay my two ore, and I'm going to pay three bucks to do this. One, two, three. Why do you choose three or six? It's all about your neighbors. Because I am within two spaces of an opponent player, these are neighboring systems, and if you um, upgrade to a trading house in a neighbor with a neighboring system, it costs half as much. Because it's a trading house, it engages in trade. So because Jen is my neighbor, this only cost me three instead of six. And so I, I paid my three bucks, I paid my two ore, I, and that's my first turn. I upgraded a mine into a trade house. I am done, it is now Jen's turn. And you know what? Jen also sees this, so she's going to chase after it just as fast. Jen is going to upgrade one of hers, uh, the, and she's going to get the same neighboring bonus as me. So it's going to cost her one, two, three, and one, two, three. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Hold on a second, folks. I got a little carried away there. Let's not do this yet. One, two, three, one, two. Right, okay. So here's the dealio. I upgraded this. I got the discount. Um, for being a neighbor, there's another neighbor benefit as well when you build adjacent to neighbors, which is, it was on my turn, um, any neighbors who are next to my new building I get have the opportunity to cycle power right now because, of course, they're making new intergalactic relations with this new um, planet that's next to them. So in this case, I just built a level two building neighboring Jen. So that means if Jen wants to, since it was a level 2 building, Jen can lose 2 victory points. And at the beginning of the game, everybody starts with 10. Jen is going to lose 2 points to cycle 2 power. Boom. So now, next time she cycles power, she can start getting some actually ready because there's none in the dead zone. So Jen took advantage of me building next to her. And now it's her turn. The exact same thing is going to happen. Jen is going to build next to me. It's going to cost her 2 ore and only 3 bucks. And I'm a neighbor, so I am also going to lose 2 points to do 2 cycling. And look at this. I cycle this, and now there's nothing here, so I get one more cycling. Boom. The Mind Stone, or the Brain Stone. The Brain Stone is now ready to be deployed. And what does it mean? Basically, a Brain Stone is the equivalent of 3 of these things. So it's 3 total power. Now, once I use this, for like one of these special abilities down here, it cycles back over here, and then I got to cycle it all the way through again before it can go into place. All right, so anyway, but I might worry about that later. So that was Jen's turn. Both of our turns, we both did the exact same thing. We upgraded, and we both benefited uh, by being adjacent. So it's good to be neighbors in the in the Terra Mystica universe, or the, this is actually called the Terra Mystica galaxy, and we're neighbors. We both did that. My turn again. Now I'm going to upgrade again. I've now got a trading house. I'm going to convert it into my Interstellar Institute. So it comes off the board, and the Interstellar Institute comes on the board, and this costs a bit more. It costs four ore. One, two, three, four. I'm almost completely out of ore, and six space bucks. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, and I positioned it. Now, I've given up 
you know, but when I had this, I was going to be making three extra bucks every round, but now I'm not making that. Instead, because I've got my institute in place, I've unlocked my special power, plus I'll get to cycle power every round at the beginning of every round from now on. And I have completed my goal. I have built my institute, which means I immediately score five sweet, sweet points. So, um, one, two, three, four, five. So I lost. All right. So um, I'm in the money, everybody. And I've got my institute. And now remember, Jen is still a neighbor. I just built a level three building. So if Jen wants to, she can sacrifice three victory points to um, cycle three power. And then this power is set up, ready to go. Three points is a lot. But you know what? She will do it. She'll give up three more. One, two, three. Um, to get one, two, three. Now, Jen has unlocked three power. So have I through my mind stone or my brain stone. But anyway, so uh, that was uh, my second turn. And now it's Jen's second turn. So Jen could do the exact same thing. Hey, she's got the resources. She could jump up, unlock. Her. She could basically create a federation. That's the special thing she unlocks. Whereas me, I unlocked my cool special social ability. But Jen's not going to do that right yet. Or don't, because Jen's going to go in a different direction. Instead of just coming up to the Institute, Jen is going to zig over here and start working on making laboratories and then an academy. Jen's got her eye on an academy instead of an Institute right now. Why? Because if she builds this academy, her race will be smart enough to understand quantum cubes. Um, and she will get rid of this. And because quantum cubes are maybe the most valuable resource in the game. They can be used for lots of really cool special powers, all kinds of stuff. So, Jen is going to upgrade again. Um, oh, but here, yeah, and, and I'm happy for it. So, but Jen, instead of going up, she's going to come over this way. It's going to cost her. Now, there's, there's only disc, neighboring discounts when you're making a trade house. No neighboring discounts for institutes or academies or anything like that. So, Jen's got to spend one, two, three, and five, one, two, three, four, five to turn her trade house into uh, now. So Jen has increased the amount of knowledge she's making every round and decreased the money. And um, because I'm a neighbor, I say, hey, you just made a, a level two. Yeah, I'll lose two points, one, two, to cycle two power. Boom! Now I've got five power at the ready that I can use on my turn. Um, and I definitely want to use that totally. <clears throat> so that's pretty cool. But because I've got my institute in place, my special power is that whenever so whenever somebody builds adjacent to me and I get to do my um, my special, or everybody, I get to cycle power, I get to charge power is what it's called, I get a benefit of generating one power out of nothing because we're social instex. And so I just created another power. My whole race has become more powerful now because Jen built next to me. Jen knew it. Jen knew she was going to be giving me this advantage. By, I mean, because remember, she could have upgraded over here. Instead of building this lab over here, it could have been over here. She would not have been my neighbor. I wouldn't be able to take advantage of my special ability. I wouldn't have been able to have gotten to my Mind Stone so quick. But Jen built next to me because she needs a lot of money to go to a lab and then to go to a, uh, an academy. So anyway, so I got extra power. I'm more powerful than ever before. Yay! Although this is dead power. So in the future, if I want to cycle power, I've got to get this up before I can move more over there. Okay. So that was Jen's turn. But there's one more thing. Whenever you build a lab or an academy, you can see there's this picture here, this little outline. That means technology. Every time you build one of these, you unlock a tech. And I forgot to mention, as part of setup, in addition to making the board and getting the objectives and finding out what the boosters are, we had to lay out all the technology tiles in random spots on the technology board. There are these 10 basic ones. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. No, no, nine. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, whatever. Uh, yeah. No. Eight. No, nine. There are these nine basic techs. Jen um, is now going to give herself one of these technologies that will last for the rest of the game. Now, interestingly, there are also one, two, three, four, five, six uh, advanced technologies. Um, but you cannot take an advanced technology until you've worked your way up on that uh, aligning tech. Once you've made it up this far um, and you have created a federation, you can then get an advanced technology. So advanced tech, that's way off in the future. But for now, Jen can take any one of these basic techs. And as a bonus, uh, she can also move up one on a tech tree. If she takes this, she moves up here. If she takes this, she moves up here and increases her navigation skills. If she takes any of these three, she can move up on any of the tracks. And you know, again, these were placed out. These, all these techs are going to be in every game. 
There's one for every player because uh, each player can learn each of these texts. These are randomly selected every time. These are uh, the same, but they're put in different places. So, um, you know, in a, few, in a future game, this might have been over here, which means if you wanted to get the power cycling of, uh, technology, you would have to work your way up the diplomacy track, as an example. But Jen, Jen does want this. Jen is going to, because she has made a lab, she gets to take any of these texts. She will take the power cycling tech. Um, which means, since it wasn't tied to any of these, Jen can move up on any technology track now. And what does she want to move up on? If she moves up here, she will increase her range because she'll be a better navigator, so she can get to planets two spaces away from her. But, um, let's see, if she moves up here, she can start doing Gaia projects. And Jen definitely does want to do Gaia projects, so I think Jen is moving up and Jen has her first Gaia converter thing. So Jen can now start converting these transdimensional planets into Gaia planets, which is good because she likes Gaia planets. Um, and you know, once she turns this, hey, it's right next door. She'll be able to populate that Gaia planet. Yay. OK. So um, that was Jen's turn. She um, invested in technology, so she'll be making more knowledge in the future. She got the tech. Now she can activate this whenever she wants, because remember, you can activate orange actions on your turn. Jen has an orange action she can activate. Um, and I piggybacked off her, and so that was Jen's turn. And now she's just one step away um, from turning this into an academy, which will unlock the mysteries of quantum mechanics for her. Uh, so she won't have that, you know, hanging around her neck anymore. Phew, that was a big turn. It's my turn again. But you know what, folks? I think if you want to watch a little bit more, you can...